precious Lord, take my hand, lead me on, help me stand. I am tired, I am weak, and I am worn. Through the storm, through the night, lead me. Welcome to the People Concerned for the Unborn Child, PCUC's banquet. We are in our 49th year of pro-life advocacy. We are the oldest pro-life group in Western Pennsylvania, and we're all glad you're here. Sit back, relax, and get ready to enjoy yourself. We're going to begin with the Knights of Columbus. They're going to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Would you please rise? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you to our wonderful friends at the Knights of Columbus. Now we're going to have Deacon Jim Grab, who will lead us in saying grace. Gotcha. In our prayers and in our thanksgiving today, let us remember a very faithful, longtime board member of PCUC, Lauren Hartman, who passed away this past week. Let us pray. We are a family. For one another, we are love and trial, strength and trouble. Even when far apart, we belong to one another, and in various ways, we remember and pray for one another. We join now to give thanks to our God and to ask for God's blessing on this gathering, those who are present and those who are not here. Bless our efforts, our strength, our minds, so that we may continue our fight for the unborn and continue our own quest to change the hearts and the minds of those who seek abortions. Let us never forget the 40 million plus souls who are casualties of this struggle, this war. May they achieve eternal happiness in life with you forever and bless the food we are about to receive, its preparers, its servers, amen. amen. McGee is the abortion hospital in the area. Uh, Meredith uh, doesn't mind if you go and walk around outside McGee or go inside and go to the chapel. When I go, I usually sit in the front hall and just sit and look at the, how beautiful the place is, the people coming in and going out and uh, some of them are being healed, but uh, McGee is an abortion hospital, and for that, we have to pray that it will stop. We have some extra special people here today who are champions of our culture, of the Constitution, and there are leaders in Harrisburg and Washington, D.C. Pat Toomey was a conservative and a pro-life leader before he came out, became our U.S. Senator. We want to appreciate him and vote for him. Today he is represented by Steve Meredith and his wife Kelly and their beloved baby Preston. We have two people who are very close to our hearts 
She was a volunteer at PCUC before, when she was in high school. And he, because he makes no bones about his determination to protect innocent life, we have U.S. Congressman Keith Rothfuss and his wife, Elsie. I live on Route 48 in North Versailles, and I saw two signs in yards for Steve Schlock. I would like everybody to know he's here, and he's going to be in the 25th district. <clears throat> Did I get everybody? Against Mike Doyle, who used to be pro-life, uh, invited me to come to Republican headquarters and meet Raja. And I met him last week. What a wonderful, wonderful guy, doing a fine job. And we're expecting a miracle for Kim. She's a lovely, lovely lady. And you, you did a good job that day, too. Thank you. Now you can have the rest of your lunch. People Concerned for the Unborn Child presents our Founders Award to Sandra Strong with deepest gratitude and esteem. Your life is a masterpiece of tireless service to God's most precious children and their mothers. By your hospitality, generosity, and joyful charity, you make the world a haven of hope and love. And then, thank you, Marley, I give thanks to my God in every remembrance of you, being confident of this very thing, that who hath begun a good work in you will perfect it unto the day of Jesus Christ. Thank you. I belong to Our Lady of Joy for 45 years. And this is wonderful. Thank you. Sitting back there in the back, are the most wonderful group of men any of us are ever. Uh, I get it because my son is a knight. But in the back of every issue are lists of the activities that these guys get involved in. And every single thing they do is for the benefit of those who are less fortunate, those who are involved in floods and fires, uh, those who have no place to go, no place to live, and we are forever in this area indebted to them because they are the guys who are providing many of the pregnancy support centers with their ultrasound equipment. And we know that if a woman sees her baby on an ultrasound image, there's 99 chances out of 100 that she will not abort her baby. Let's say thank you to the Knights of Columbus. A guy who emigrated from Australia as our speaker for today, I got to know him just a little bit by reading his thinnest book, Green Card Warrior. Only later did I learn that President Trump called it a must read. This guy is the first author who two times in history a sitting president ever, ever endorsed a book.
He has several other books, too, and you can get them. They're right up here after you've heard his story. Nick overcame a rare childhood cancer with just a 5% chance of survival when he was only 16 months old. That could have led a lot of people to sit back and stay safe, not Nick. Nick's story of coming to America is like a mystery movie. Will he make it this time? Who's the joker who keeps coming and getting between him and permanent residents in the United States? Rose Liptak heard his story. Since then, she's his biggest fan, and today I think we will all join his fan club. But it's not my story, it's Nick's. Come on up, Nick, we want to hear it. Thank you, Helen. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. What an honor, pleasure, and privilege it is to be able to be here with each and every single one of you. Thank you, Helen, for that wonderful, that marvelous introduction. I want to extend my profound gratitude to Rose, who was absolutely instrumental in ensuring that I could be here with you this afternoon. Uh, she saw me speak a little over a year ago and determined in typical Rose Liptak fashion that she would accept no other outcome other than me being your keynote speaker. So this is an event that I've looked forward to. Please. This is an event that I've looked forward to and had on my calendar now for some time. So I am thrilled to be here with you on this cold Sunday afternoon in Pittsburgh. My inaugural visit to Pittsburgh, making this all the more auspicious an occasion. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, what an honour, pleasure and privilege it is to be in the land of the free and the home of the brave. In the world's exceptional nation, in civilization's indispensable country. And to top it all off, if all of that weren't enough, right here in the cradle of liberty, the great state of Pennsylvania. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to share with you a story. And as I share this story with you, I invite you to momentarily close your eyes and really imagine what it is that I'm sharing with you. It's December of 1985. Two parents are at their wits' end. Something is wrong with their 16-month-old child. For months, they've been to doctor after doctor, pediatrician after pediatrician, but nobody can tell them what is wrong. One night, with their child even more unsettled than usual, they head to the emergency ward of the local children's hospital. The ward is almost deserted, but there is one overnight doctor there, a young man with a smiling face, and an accent. As he looks the child over, his smile quickly evaporates. He tells the parents that he can't be sure, but he has a hunch that he may have seen this before. And he fears that their child has a very rare form of childhood cancer. The very next day, the parents' worst fears would be confirmed their child had stage four neuroblastoma, a very rare form of childhood cancer indeed. The parents were mine. The child was me. The doctor, it turned out, was an American. The cause of neuroblastoma remains unknown to this day with only one in 100,000 children being diagnosed with it each year. Notoriously difficult to diagnose when it is, the tumour has almost always already metastasized, 
a child, an infant, a baby with stage four neuroblastoma is given just a 5% chance of life. Only one in 20 survive. For three and a half years, I underwent chemotherapy, radiotherapy, and an operation. And through the healing hands of God, our master physician, I defied the odds and lived. It was the instincts of an American doctor, fresh out of college, just in Australia for a summer residency that proved crucial to my survival. So I haven't only studied American exceptionalism, I've lived it. In fact, I am alive because of it. Once I became of an age where I could properly comprehend the magnitude of my escape, I determined that I would never ever waste a single second of a minute of an hour of a day of a year ever. And I'm proud to tell you that I have pretty much lived up to that self-pledge. I was the valedictorian of my school. I was publicly elected to political office at the age of 19, becoming one of the youngest ever elected councilmen in Sydney, Australia. The first election I ever voted in, I voted for myself. It's all been downhill since then. Just eight days after my 21st birthday, on the 13th of September 2005, I was elected the youngest deputy mayor in Australian history in Sydney, a record which still stands to this day. I am a four-time best-selling author. I have the distinction of being the first author to have ever had a book endorsed by a sitting president of the United States. And of course, that distinction came last year on the 3rd of March when President Trump took to Twitter, where else, <laughs> to declare that my book, Green Card Warrior, was a must read and that I was a great American. He followed it up six months later with a, another endorsement of my previous book, Retaking America, Crushing Political Correctness. That does sound like his kind of book, doesn't it? <laughs> Making me the only author to have had two books endorsed by a sitting president of the United States. And this has led many in the media to rather generously refer to me as the president's favorite author. Uh, and in fact, uh, the president was photographed last year by the press corps boarding Marine One on his way to Camp David with retaking America under his arm. So that has been quite the journey. Many of you will recognize me from television. I'm a Fox News and Fox Business commentator. Uh, I have spoken in 36 of the 50 states. I've given keynote addresses in five different countries. Worldwide, I am considered an authority on American exceptionalism. In fact, I have decided to dedicate my life to promoting, protecting and perpetuating what I consider to be the greatest idea ever, the American idea. To top all of that off, if all of that weren't enough, on the 29th of July 2016, after four and a half long, torturous and arduous years, including a stint on the no-fly list, courtesy of the Barack Obama administration and John Kerry State Department, and close to $50,000 later, I finally legally immigrated to the United States of America. I'm an American. I was telling Congressman Rothfuss earlier that uh, Governor Perry has appointed me an honorary Texan back in 2013, uh, that Governor Mary Fallon has appointed me an honorary Oklahoman, that uh, Governor Pete Ricketts has made me a Nebraskan Admiral, and that uh, Governor Matt Bevan formally commissioned me a Kentucky Colonel last year. And uh, the word is that Governor Scott, before he leaves in Florida, is going to designate me a great Floridian. And I was just speculating with him on the possibility of the current governor of Pennsylvania offering me some kind of similar award. Uh, 
His response was, good luck with that. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, let me tell you a little bit more about who I am. As all of you can very clearly tell from my accent, I hail from South Pittsburgh. <laughs> very deep South, Southern Pittsburgh. What is it that I believe in? I believe in God, personal responsibility, the sanctity of human life, limited government, a strong national defence, the right to bear arms, the state of Israel, up there with all of those things, ladies and gentlemen, I believe in the United States of America. And if there is one take-home message that I have for you today, if there is one thing that I want you to recall as you go home this evening and rest your head on your cold pillow, it is this. Despite the undeniable, incontrovertible and indisputable challenges, problems, threats and realities that currently afflict the United States of America today. This is still easily, by far and away, hands down, head and shoulders, the greatest country in the history of the world. <clears throat> Every single time I speak in front of an elementary school, middle school, public high school or college audience, I look those students in the eyes and I tell them that the day that they were born in the United States of America is the day that they won the lottery of life. And they got the most incredible, the most amazing, the most remarkable, the most sensational head start on anyone and everyone everywhere else. This is the best country in the world to be born in. This is the best country in the world to live in. This is the best country in the world to work in. This is the best country in the world to start a business in. This is the best country in the world to realize a dream. This is the only country in the world where success is not yet resented, but still admired and aspired to. This is the only country in the world where you are free to color outside of the lines and not be punished. This is the only country in the world where you can rise above any set of circumstances to go on and achieve whatever it is that you want to achieve. This is the only country in the world where your first language or last name means absolutely nothing. This is the only country in the world where you can start with nothing and make absolutely everything. This is the only country in the world where failure is not fatal, where you can fall down 5,000 times and get up 5,001 if you've got the grit, the determination and the hustle. Thomas Edison had a thousand cracks at the light bulb. Colonel Harlan Sanders had his recipe for fried chicken rejected 1,009 times before he was able to go on and start up Kentucky Fried Chicken. Henry Ford went bankrupt twice, almost three times. Same story with Walt Disney. Abraham Lincoln lost 14 elections on the trot. P.T. Barnum's first five circuses failed. This is a unique place. After all, where else can you go bankrupt three times and become president of the United States of America? You see, ladies and gentlemen, America is special because America is not just a country, not simply a stretch of land, not merely a geographic entity. America is an idea. It is an ideal, a notion, an improbable and daring experiment that remains just as improbable and daring today. It's the hope that banishes all hopelessness. It's the shot that was heard around the world and still is. There are four ways that a nation is said to be exceptional. Culturally, militarily, economically and scientifically. And on each of those four measurements, in almost 5,000 years of recorded human history, with less than 5% of the world's population. Let me repeat that again. With less than 5% of the world's population, 
America has dominated those four spheres to an extent previously considered impossible. But none of that success, none of that power, none of that might, none of that wealth, none of that influence just happened. None of it was accidental. None of it was incidental. No, to the contrary, all of it was extraordinarily deliberate, extremely intentional. You see, the most brilliant men to have ever walked this earth were our founders who understood that the way to unlocking human ingenuity, the way to unleashing human creativity, the way to driving human accomplishment was to make sure that men and women were as unencumbered as possible by the need for government approvals and red tape. It's for precisely the same reason that the United States of America has ascended to the position of guardian of liberty as the custodian of civilization. I want you to contemplate for just a moment what the world might look like without the United States of America. North Korea would invade South Korea. Taiwan would be overrun by China. War, maybe nuclear, would break out in the Middle East. Russia would attempt to rebuild the Soviet Empire. Islamic terrorists would act with complete impunity. Tyrants in North Africa would run around even more mercilessly than what they already do. Cataclysmic natural disasters would have no concerted, coordinated response effort. Individual liberty would gradually diminish and ultimately become extinct. The world would be covered in a cavernous style, biblical style darkness. That's what a world without the United States of America looks like. And that's why it's in the, in, in the interest of everyone, no matter who you are, where you come from, where you were born, what you do, which one of the new 57 different genders you choose to identify with, <laughs> what bathroom you elect to use, even if you have never so much as even set your little toe on American soil, it's in your interests that America be as robust, as self-confident and as self-assertive as possible. Why? Because the equation is very simple. What is good for America is good for the world. When America is strong, the world is strong. When America is weak, the world is a weak and dangerous place. Now, that's not my hypothesis that I've scribbled on the back of a cocktail napkin after a few too many drinks at the Crown Plaza Green Tree, <laughs> Pittsburgh West. We were living that reality real time up until just 22 months ago when we had elites at the highest levels of the federal government that were insistent on ensuring that America retreated in the world, that it vacated its traditional role of leading from the front and instead elected to lead from behind. The result, while the world is now calming with the new administration, it remains infinitely more dangerous than it has been for a very, very long period of time. Ladies and gentlemen, political correctness is killing the United States of America. You see, most people think that political correctness is merely an imposition on speech, simply something that tells us what, you, what we can say and what we can't say. Well, that would be egregious enough with our proud tradition of the First Amendment. But I'm here to tell you with regret rich in my voice that political correctness is infinitely more than that, way more than that. Political correctness is a way of life. It's a mentality. It's a cultural mindset. It's one that says that you should strive for mediocrity and not greatness, that you shouldn't colour outside of the lines lest you be punished, that you should resent those that have differentiated themselves professionally, financially or in some other fashion more so than you. In fact, political correctness mandates that success and achievement be a measurement of how much butt you kiss as opposed to how much butt you kick. What could be more un-American and anti-American than that? 
Political correctness is a choking conformity, an intellectual tyranny, a totalitarian ideology that strips us of our individualism, eliminates our patriotism, removes our self-confidence. And in doing so, political correctness is transforming the American dream into the European nightmare. And why on earth would we want to follow the trajectories of the once grand nations of Europe, now with demography in decline, Islam in the ascendancy, where churches are being routinely transformed into nightclubs? Those countries, those societies, have become moribund and pedestrian and vanilla and grey. They have no moral compass. There is no moral clarity. There's no passion, there's no hunger, there are no dreams, there are no inventions, there's no innovation. That's not the future that we want for the United States of America. That's not the future that we want for our children and our grandchildren and our great, 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 great grandchildren. And that's certainly not the future that our founders had envisioned for us. See, America is, is, is complex, but American exceptionalism is really, really simple. It's individualism, not collectivism. Patriotism, not relativism. God, not government. Faith, not secularism. Life, not death. E pluribus unum, not radical multiculturalism. It's equality of opportunity, not equality of outcome. These are the virtues and values that have differentiated historically the United States of America from every other society on this earth. And yet proponents and advocates of political correctness would seek to eliminate every single one of those points of differentiation. Ladies and gentlemen, I love life as somebody that almost lost it as a baby, as an infant. I wake up every morning and I thank God to be alive. And for people that don't appreciate life, for people that don't understand life, for people that want to casually dismiss life, I consider that to be a personal affront. There is nothing more important than being courageous and standing on principle. And I am honoured to be in a room replete with people that have throughout their lives shown and demonstrated incredible courage, even when it's against the moral current of the day the absolutely shameful and disgraceful display that we saw just in the last few weeks with the appointment of Justice Kavanaugh to the Supreme Court was about one thing and one thing alone. It was about life. And this is how evil people behave. This is how evil people want to run a protection racket for the evil that they want to continue to perpetrate. And that's why each and every single one of us has the most incredible responsibility, has the most awesome obligation conceivable. And that is to remain steadfast in our beliefs, to demonstrate our courage, and to always, always support and protect life. Thank you. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it's very personal to me. Life is very personal to me and what is going to happen to the United States of America and in the United States of America is very personal to me. And just like with any issue, you can pick any issue, the only country that has got the ability 
to demonstrate leadership on an issue is the United States of America. So if our goal is to protect life, it begins and ends here in the United States of America. Because only if the United States of America takes a stand, only if the United States of America is sufficiently morally courageous to stand up for life will the rest of the world then follow suit. What happens to America is personal for me because I chose to come here. I came to make, not take, to give, not receive, to join the place, not complain about it or change it. I came because I knew that this was the greatest country in the history of the world. I came because I knew that this was the place that would afford me the most freedom and the most opportunity to achieve the dreams that God put in my heart. But I also came here in no small measure to make sure that the United States of America does not turn out like the country I felt I had to leave. Most Americans, like most people in the world, think that in Australia people box kangaroos by day and wrestle crocodiles by night. If that were the case, maybe I might still be there. But the international perception is vastly different to the domestic reality. Australia is and has always been a far more European place in instinct, in proclivity, in culture and in setup. And anybody that has even a cursory understanding of policy areas such as healthcare or gun ownership will know that America truly does stand alone when it comes to culture, virtues, values and setup. And that's why I'm on a mission. I'm on a mission to make sure that every single American from north to south, east to west and everywhere in between knows how lucky and how fortunate and how blessed they are to be an American. But especially our young, particularly the next generation of American leaders. Those that will be bequeathed the most incredible responsibility. Keeping the great American experiment alive. I want to make sure that every child in this country has a heart beating for America. I don't want our children just lukewarm on America. I want them burning for America. That's why I set up an organization called FLAG, the Foundation for Liberty and American Greatness, one of the fastest growing nonprofits in America today. FLAG is all about two things. Number one, teaching civics, and number two, promoting patriotism in public schools. We do it three ways, through the creation and distribution of resources for students and teachers and parents. Number two, professional development for teachers, teaching teachers how to incorporate American exceptionalism and patriotism in their lesson plans, curriculum development, and the general school environment. And number three, classroom visits. Last year, I went into 42 public schools and I was utterly alarmed at what I discovered. I found that the overwhelming majority of young Americans did not have even a basic understanding or appreciation of three founding documents, the United States Constitution, the Declaration of Independence, or the Federalist Papers. So I decided to do something about it. We worked with interns from the late Justice Antonin Scalia's office, and we got the United States Constitution into simple, plain, easy to understand English, the world's first kid-friendly constitution. We launched it last year on Fox News with a live three-hour event on the Fox News Plaza. And this is what it looks like. This is the world's first kid-friendly constitution. On the heels of that stunning success, in April, FLAG launched the world's first kid-friendly Declaration of Independence 
at the Trump Hotel in Washington, D.C. with one of our advisory board members, you may have heard of him, Mr. Bill O'Reilly in attendance. Same concept, same idea. And I'm really proud to tell you that as of two weeks ago, we now have either one of these two resources in less than a year in the hands of more than a quarter of a million American students in all 50 states. And so popular is this resource, we get testimonials from public schools in California <laughs> telling us how much they enjoy them. And so popular is this resource that we have actually now begun a partnership with the White House where every time a child comes in contact with the White House, either through correspondence or personally meeting the President or the First Lady, they get the colouring in version of our United States kid-friendly constitution. And in just a couple of months time, we'll be launching the world's first kid-friendly selected readings of the Federalist Papers. Uh, in addition to that, we have our Flag Schools Pledge, which gets schools to commit to doing three things. Number one, display an American flag in every classroom. Number two, recite the Pledge of Allegiance every day. And number three, sing the national anthem before all major sporting events. And I'm proud to tell you that as of this morning, we now have 4,294 schools signed up to that commitment. Uh, thank you. As our platform has grown, so, have, so has the work that we do. In addition to our efforts patriotically in public schools, we have also declared war on this idea that every child has got to go to college. I went to college, I got two degrees, I had the time of my life. But the reality, but the reality is that college is not for everyone. We need plumbers and electricians and carpenters and welders. And there's some really good reasons. There's some really good reasons that we don't want our children going to college unless they are tailor-made for it. Number one, we want them to avoid the almost inevitable liberal indoctrination that awaits them on any college campus. Number two, we don't want them graduating up to their eyeballs saddled in debt. Student loan debt is at an epidemic high, more than $1.3 trillion. Number three, we want them to have almost guaranteed success in being able to go and getting a job. How many graduates graduate and then can't find work? And number four, and most appealing of all, we want to give the greatest number of young Americans the possibility to one day go and do the most American thing of all, start their own business, employ people, create wealth, and achieve the American dream. So ladies and gentlemen, let me close with this. A few months ago, America celebrated her 242nd birthday. It was a time for great celebration, but I would also submit a time for sober and somber contemplation. Because if you go and ask any historian worth their salt how long great nations tend to last, they'll tell you somewhere between 230 and 270 years. And that puts America right in the kill zone. And for the first time, to make matters worse, the enemies of the United States are no longer only foreign, they're also domestic. There are people within America rooting for America's diminishment, decline. So the battle, the war, the struggle, the fight that we are going to have to embark on is going to be worse than any that we have been through before. But as a lifelong student of American history, I remain unswervingly convinced that our best days still lie ahead. From the early defeats by Britain in the War of Independence, to the loss of the Philippines, to Pearl Harbor, to the days following September 11, every single time America has been under attack, every single time freedom and America have been shoved up against a corner wall in a room, America has emerged bigger 
and stronger and better than ever before. It was Alexis de Tocqueville, the famous French nobleman who came out here in the 18th century, who observed in his sociological masterpiece, Democracy in America, that the true genius of the United States lay in her people's ability to recorrect a trajectory, to change a curve. So Winston Churchill, the great wartime Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, half American himself, once affectionately jibed that America always does the right thing after exhausting every other option. <laughs> and here I stand before you today as a third outsider, telling you that I identify the same boomerang spirit, the same resilience in the American psyche. For the last 60 years, ladies and gentlemen, there has been a culture war raging in this country. But only one side has been fighting it. They've done it with violence, the threat of violence, the hostile takeovers of universities and lies. They have been, they have been dedicated to nothing short of our complete and total annihilation. In this quest, they have been governed only by two things, the rules of Saul Alinsky and the Chicago mob. While this culture war has raged, we patriots, we hard-working American men and women have been busy paying off our mortgages, saving up our money to send our children off to college. And we have consistently and constantly and continually sought the higher plane and prized things like collegiality and dignity and propriety to the point now when we wake up in the morning and we almost choke on our bacon and eggs as we watch Fox and Friends because we cannot believe what our eyes are seeing. The local high school is changing its name. The statue outside the courthouse that's been there for eons has been designated for removal. The elementary school two counties away has now officially changed the school calendar from Columbus Day to read Indigenous Peoples Day. Ladies and gentlemen, this stuff is happening day in, day out. There is a relentless assault on American values day in and day out. It never, ever stops. This is a fight that we did not start. But this is a fight that we must finish. This is a fight that we want. This is a fight that we need. This is a fight that we must win. The reason that we are in the predicament that we are in is because the people that run all of the cultural institutions that shape and generate our culture are people that don't love America the same way we love America are people that don't believe in the same things that we believe in, are people that don't like the things about America that we like. They want to change America into something that it never has been and it never should be. These are people that don't believe in American values. They believe in European values. And they are changing our society. And so this is not just a fight for America, this is a fight for the entire world. But here's the thing, this right here is freedom's coliseum. Freedom will live or freedom will perish right here because the rest of the world is too far gone. And the pages of the history books yet to be written will reflect the actions that we determined to take at this juncture. Did we invest in the next generation of Americans? Did we make sure that people knew what American values were? Did we pass down what it means to be an American? Did we teach Americanism? 
Did we talk to our neighbours? Did we talk to our relatives? Did we go into our churches and pull our fellow congregates out of the pews and to the voting booths? Did we make every conceivable possible effort to save this country, to keep America the America that we've always known and always loved? Or did we decide to just pass it on to the next generation? Did we leave it for too late? Ladies and gentlemen, I love this country. I love life. And I will do anything to protect both of those. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. God bless you. God bless Pennsylvania. And God bless the United States of America. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, I, I just want to let you know that uh, I do have all four of my best-selling books here. Uh, they're available. They're signed, personalised, autographed, blessed, whatever it'll take to get you to buy them. Uh, the books are $25 each, two for 40 three for 50 or we're doing a special here today. You can get the whole set, signed, autographed, personalised, for $60. We also have our kid-friendly student's constitution and our kid-friendly declaration of independence. They're available for a donation. So please come and see us. We have lots of information here. We take cash, checks, credit card, monopoly, whatever, whatever you've got, uh, we will take. Uh, for those of you that are interested in supporting FLAG and would like to find out more information, or would like to make introductions to people that could potentially support FLAG, please come and share your information. Thank you and God bless. Okay, thank you very much. Wow. That's all I can say. Wow. And a little aside, I can tell you this. Nick has been very good to PCUC. That's all I'm going to say. Nick has been very good to PCUC. So if you can support his work through the purchase of his books, it will be much appreciated. We have two more things on our agenda. The first, we're going to have a benediction from Pastor Brian, and then we'll have the awarding of all the prizes. So Pastor Brian, would you come forward? He's coming. Pastor Brian is down to Planned Parenthood every Friday. That is a call. That is a call to fact fight. It's an alarm call and it's a call to fight. Through the centuries, it has been. And I wanted to add a little something to what Nick said, which was an excellent talk. Short. <laughs> She's my keeper, <laughs> my wife. Um, going through the Bible, you see the, the failing of various uh, civilizations, even in Israel, where things would go downhill and they're almost be destroyed. One of the biggest signs is the sacrifice of children. And what are we doing in this country? Sacrificing, I don't know, Nikki, how many, how many children this year or last year? How many? 2,000? 2,800. 17. Oh, that's here. So, so this is where our fight is. This is the mindset that Nick talked about that we're fighting against. Where with, we, with, with impunity, kill our children. 
and that's usually the Dolph's death sign of a civilization. But it's not too late. It's not too late. You're all here for the fight. So I'm going to pronounce the ben benediction. My wife will help. I'm going to do it on the uh, ironic blessing. God told Moses to tell, uh, for Aaron to tell his people this blessing. Are you his people? You his people? Okay. I'm going to do it in Hebrew and then in English. Yavrekeka Adonai Vaish Merecha Ye er Adonai Pahanav Elecha Vechuneka Isa Adonai Panav Elecha Veyasem Lacha Shalom Veyakem Lacha Shalom the Lord bless you and protect you. May he make his face shine upon you. The Lord bless you and protect you. May he make his face shine upon you. And be gracious unto you and lift his countenance to who you and give you peace and give you peace. Oh, Amen. You. Amen. Thank Amen. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was beautiful. Okay.